And so I'm just going to put out some general questions and um, Paul and Stephanie, you know, let's just hear your perspectives and uh, let's make this like an open dialogue. So the first question is, what attracted you to Columbia University? And I think I'm going first, Lisa. Sure. Okay. Um, so I'm a, I, I'm a New York City girl and I was fortunate. I spent my years, uh, undergraduate years at the University of Michigan. And then I lived abroad as, uh, I, I lived abroad studying in Greece. And then I, I became a medic a volunteer medic in Greece, and I was really itching to come back home. And um, although I had wonderful offers from uh, wonderful other universities, I really wanted to polish my um, my background with, with a Columbia degree. And I, I really respected the faculty that worked there. They were very involved um, in the field of public health, not just in an academic sense, but in a job setting. Um, and that was very important to me. And you know, later on, and, and when I joined the workforce, I really saw the advantage that having a Columbia degree had. Um, you know, right or wrong, people would weed resumes when they saw that Columbia degree for public health specifically or in general. It really stood out. Um, so I, a combination of stellar faculty and just wanting to be home after being away for so long was a, was the right uh, combo for me. Paul, how about you? Tell us about your journey and what drew you to Columbia. Paul, you're on, on mute. Okay, so, um, you know, uh, uh, of course, Columbia's reputation is first and foremost, but it what was special about Columbia, I had visited um, NYU, my brother and sister had gone to NYU, I had visited you know, Princeton and a number of other great schools but it was something special about the day I visited Columbia. It was a beautiful spring day. Everyone was in the square on the steps. Uh, they were throwing Frisbees. Some folks were sitting out uh, in front of Low Library playing the guitar. It was crowded. There was so much energy. And I just walked you know, out there and I said, wow, I want to be part of this. It was, it was incredible. So uh, really right after that, that visit, um, and and also, um, I got a sense from the interviews that I had with other alum uh, that it was a very special place, and I was going to be going to school in in the middle of New York, and it was it was its own campus. Um, after that visit, that was it. I was I was hooked. So. Uh, I made Columbia my first choice, and fortunately, I was uh, I was accepted, and um, um, uh, I immediately responded, and uh, I, I was uh, happy that um, I ended up going to Columbia. Now, Carlos reviewed what your bios are all about. You're both very accomplished professionals, uh, but I'd love to hear and share with our audience today, uh, what are, you know, some of the things that you do, what are the, some of the projects you're working on, uh, what keeps you motivated, and how do you see being a Latinx professional as an advantage in the workplace today? Wow, those are great questions. Um, Stephanie, do, do you want to? Oh, no, you go this time first, Paul. Oh, Thank you. I'm gonna go this, I'm gonna go this. Okay, so so I'll, I'll tell you what I'm doing, and um, but you, with respect to your question about the advantages of Latinx, the, I think the greatest advantage is the the rich diversity of the Latino community. Um, that's first and foremost. Um, when Carlos was giving the intros, he mentioned my name, and he said that you know my my father's Italian and my mother's my mother's Dominican. Um, you know, Latinos come from from every culture, from every uh, you know, from every area of the world. Um, I, I I I've traveled you know, pretty much everywhere, and I run into Dominicans anywhere you go. It, it, it's an amazing thing, and um, Latinos bring so, so much uh, to to every place where, um, you know, they bring, they bring so much to the workplace, they bring so much to um, uh, the field of entertainment, they, build, they bring so much to so many different areas. 
And I, you know, I'm, I'm really proud to say that I'm, I'm part of the Latinx community. Um, so with that said, I've, I've worked in a number of different, different areas. I mentioned it a little bit earlier. Um, I, I started out working for large law firms. I went from there uh, to work for law firms in New Jersey. Then I worked for uh, the Speaker of the New Jersey Assembly as counsel to the, to the Speaker, who's now a member of Congress. Um, currently, I'm working for a cosmetics company as in-house counsel. I do corporate law. Uh, previously, I've worked on large transactions. Uh, someone earlier mentioned uh, the city of Newark. Um, that potentially would be an entirely separate novel talking about the work that I did uh, in connection with the construction of the Prudential Arena, which is the Devil's Arena. Um, uh, I worked on the, that, the construction of that project from inception to its completion in uh, 2007. And I have so many stories about all of the characters that I worked with and encountered uh, in connection with that project. That's probably the most interesting project that I've ever worked on. I was lead counsel for all of the Newark entities. I represented the city of Newark. I represented the Newark Downtown Core Redevelopment Corporation. And at the time it was probably the largest construction project in, in the state of New Jersey. So that's probably what I'm, I'm most proud of. And um, again, back to, you know, Latinx roots, I think it gives you the ability to see things from so many different perspectives and the ability to really connect with so many different people. Um, so th those are my thoughts on, um, you know, what it is that being a, uh, a Latinx professional uh, gives you with respect to your professional uh, career. And those are the, the, the projects that I've worked on that I'm most proud of. Some incredible yeah. projects, Paul. Uh, Stephanie? Yeah, no, I mean, I, just that point of the importance of having Latinx representation in a, diver, in a you know, vast array of the workforce is for us to show we're here. We're in different sectors of, of the workforce. We're represented, we have a voice. Um, uh, you know, I spent well over 10, 15 years serving the um, Latino, predominantly Dominican uh, community uh, here in Washington Heights, upper Manhattan um, of New York City where the medical campus is based. And, um, you know, I was a big advocate for cultural competency um, in the public health programming. Um, uh, you know, staff is not always um, as diverse as it could be. Um, and, you know, really um, making sure that the population got the services that they deserved and that it resonated. Um, so it's incredibly important that we're part of every sector uh, uh, of the workforce. Um, in terms of my most proud, or are we skipping to the most proud moment in our, in our profession, Alyssa? Sure. Um, you know, certainly, um, you know, there's, there's so many, but the two that stand out for me um, is bringing the farmer's market to the 168th Street Medical Campus. Um, uh, at the time um, uh, when I left, it was uh, New York City's highest grossing, grossing uh, hospital-based farmer's market uh, by Grow NYC. And it, it meant the world to me because it bridged the medical campus, the community, the students, and the upper Manhattan community. And every step of the way I was told I couldn't do it, I shouldn't do it, don't do it, and I did it. Um, um, so it's a proud moment, it's still there and it's still vibrant. And I'm glad that Columbia students uh, can enjoy that. And then of course, getting a phone call um, from the White House and Michelle Obama, First Lady Michelle Obama's team um, and being invited um, just 12, uh, 12 people uh, throughout the country um, on the secret trip <laughs> to the, to, you know, you know, not the White House, but you know, their offices right next door and saying, listen, um, we've been watching you for the past year and we love what you're doing. And I want to copy everything you're doing. I mean, that's why we were brought there. Like, I want to study what you did because I want to do this on a nationwide level. Anyone else, I'd say you're not copying me, right? <laughs> Michelle Obama, you can copy me. That's totally fine. So it was such an honor and to see what they did with that, you know, meeting and consulting with us and all the wonderful things she did. I was definitely a highlight of my public health career. 
These are incredible accomplishments. And I think we could probably spend another whole hour just talking about the accomplishments the two of you have uh, achieved. They're super exciting. And uh, I'm sure there's so many additional detailed stories that go along with those experiences. But I wanna jump in now two feet because everybody here is really excited to learn about your journeys as authors. Uh, I'm really also excited because in our little breakout chat, I actually met a student. So there are alumni here and their students. And so I think your guidance is going to be critical uh, for those who really want to be published authors. So let's jump in uh, and let's just talk about what was that moment of transition in terms of, okay, I'm, I'm gonna write this book. Was it something that was sudden and you just decided you, know, you were gonna go all in? Was it something that was gonna be more long-term? And what was the inspiration specifically for those works that you've published? Great. Um... You know, for me, I was mid um, public health career and I, and, you know, I, I wasn't fully happy. I didn't feel fully satisfied. I love what I was doing. I was good at it, but something was missing. And, you know, I, I started to acknowledge that I think I always wanted to be a writer, um, but that was never presented as an option for me. And I never allowed that to be an option for me. You know, my, my parents both grew up in abject poverty on one side escaping the civil war in Greece after World War II, and my mom um, uh, coming from Santurce, Puerto Rico, um, um, El Fanguito, uh, which is just like a water at the time, a, a slum of water, Operation Bootstrap, uh, colonization of Puerto Rico, politics, you know, coming to New York City. So, you know, carrying that historical memory and weight certainly um, didn't present being a writer as something that would be a sustainable career, right or wrong. That's just, you know, my background. So I started taking classes. My husband suggested, why don't you take some classes? They're free as a Columbia employee at the School of Continuing Ed and um, started to understand how to go about and crafting a novel. And I dived right into a novel. I didn't do what a lot of MFA programs tell you to do, which are short stories. And then you do an anthology. I just Oop, went straight into a novel. And for me, to answer your, your last question, Lisa, um, you know, the advice I got from, it was Alyssa Albert was my first teacher at Columbia uh, for writing. And uh, it's the old, she might've twisted it around, take what you know and write about what you love. And, you know, I started with my first novel, I had all this historical information about Greece and World War II and my family's own um, experience um, going through that. And I'm like, I got to download this somewhere, you know, why don't we start there? And then, you know, mixing it up with my very strange interests in al alchemy and Gnosticism and all that sort of stuff. And I was able to write a novel with that guidance and just kept getting mentors, uh, luckily, as I, I moved on. Um, and then moved on to wanting to tell my mother's uh, story from Puerto Rico. Really incredible. That's such an amazing journey and so rich with multicultural influences as well. Uh, Paul, how about you? Yeah, I, I, I just want to, um, you know, a lot of what Stephanie said resonated with me, especially with respect to, you know, as she mentioned earlier, um, uh, she mentioned abject poverty. I, we, I, I suppose we, we come from uh, similar backgrounds in that regard. And for me, you know, getting into Columbia was uh, a ticket out of some of the, you know, obstacles and challenges that I experienced um, in, in my youth. And then going to law school was really just, you know, just something that was going to, you know, catapult my career, so to speak. Um, uh, I saw it as the, you know, the best way for me to succeed. Um, would it have made me the happiest? Not necessarily, because it was it was extremely challenging. It was extremely difficult. And I never really had someone to rely on that I could turn to for guidance. Um, and so uh, uh, I approached law as um, a way really to uh, enjoy a career, but was it a passion? Uh, in some in some 
respects, yes. Now I think I, uh, I really enjoy what I do, but early on it was extremely difficult. And so where do you find an outlet, uh, a love, a passion? Um, uh, I found it in writing. And I started uh, this novel um, back in 2005. And some, some folks don't believe, you know, they, they can't believe that, you know, I finished it many, many years ago and I had tried to get it published. Uh, I was probably rejected maybe a hundred different times, um, letter after letter to different, uh, to different folks, different publishing houses. And it was finally, I, I located one individual. He was a former CBS executive who had started a, a small publishing house. And um, uh, I, I sent him um, my manuscript and he said he loved it. And uh, he, he wanted it uh, to, he wanted me to send it to his editor, uh, which I did. Uh, she improved it dramatically. And that, that was my start. That was the golden prison. Um, and I'm being told they, they, they want me to work on the sequel. So I have to find inspiration for that. And my inspiration for the initial um, a novel were, were all of the incredible characters that I met uh, really in New York City uh, and many at, at, at Columbia. Um, incredible people, uh, a lot of folks who had over the top uh, personalities and characters that I found so interesting. I would take notes. And when I was looking for inspiration on what to write about, I, there was just uh, uh, so many different characters that I could turn to, some that I had grown up with and some that I encountered both at uh, Columbia undergrad, Columbia Law School, and in the greater New York City environment. Um, it was perfect for a legal thriller, perfect for, um, uh, you know, the, 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 the club scene, perfect for um, uh, uh, the mystery, uh, all of which I incorporated in uh, my original novel. And um, I, I think it's done quite well. So I want to get a little bit into the granular for our audience. Uh, you know, obviously, let's share what your favorite part about writing is, but also what are some of the bigger challenges with the process? And I, I ask these questions so that you can sort of give this retrospective guidance or insights for people who are trying to step into this space. Think Paul, right? We're going to go with Paul first. Sure. Sure. I'll 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 jump into that one. It's you know it's interesting. I was reading an article just recently. It was it was in, in it was an Esquire, and it's how to write a novel according to ten really good novelists. And you know, I, I, a lot of this stuff, um, you know, I connected with. I mean, the 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 two most important were are the two most important that really kind of. Um, spoke to me were let yourself get lost. And I think that's, that's, that's great advice. I mean, kind of, you know, pour yourself into what you're doing. And um, uh, like I said earlier, I had encountered so many interesting characters and I wanted to kind of, um, uh, I wanted to kind of, you know, play with these different characters, how they interacted with one another how they interacted with um, uh, kind of the energy in the city of New York. And I kind of got lost in that. Um, that, was, that was one piece of advice I thought was very useful in, in trying to find inspiration when writing my novel. The second thing, and I think this is even more important, is don't overcomplicate it. And what I mean by that is kind of, Focus on what it is, uh, focus on the story that you want to tell. Uh, and I also think it's important to get into details about the story, but don't overcomplicate it. Um, have fun with it. And I think that I've always have, I, I've always have had fun with my writing. 
and I didn't try and overcomplicate it. Uh, I think when you do that, um, you can lose the reader. So um, that's kind of the advice that I have. Um, Stephanie, what yeah. do you think? Yeah, I mean, we could spend the entire evening <laughs> talking about this, um, but definitely for the beginning process, just allow yourself to write, just get it on the page. Don't try to be, you know, perfect. Don't try to polish too much. Um, you know, get your story down. Don't worry about marketing. Don't worry about, I'm supposed to be doing this. Um, if a story is speaking to you, just get it out on the page um, or however you write. Um, I think, especially in today's uh, age, we can get caught up with how you're supposed to do this. And you must write this amount a day. Oh, it's all, no, it's garbage. You need to just honor your own schedules, what your own uh, life, what's going on in your life. I mean, when I wrote my first novel, um, I didn't have kids yet and I would write on my lunch break. Um, I would write late at night. Um, and uh, now I have three young kids and my mind works only in the morning, <laughs> you know? Um, but I am a more prolific writer with kids. It's not, you know, and I thought I might have the opposite problem. Um, so, you know, the bottom line is get the story out. Don't worry about marketing until you get to that stage. It's okay to understand the market as you go through the process, but just allow your creative voice um, uh, to come out. Um, and I can go on and on with some, some more tips. So I want to, again, get into a little bit of the granular, like, how did you start writing? Did you physically write out your thoughts and your ideas? Um, did you type them up? Uh, what do you recommend in retrospect? You know, do you need to have a certain format? Stephanie, you mentioned that you took some classes. Paul, yeah. I don't know if you took any classes, but really, you know, when I think about all of us here tonight, mm -hmm we all have to have a certain level of writing capability if we all went to Columbia. So, <laughs> so, so give us some insights as to how to really navigate that. I mean, I would say if it's, and what I did is seek out writing courses. And it, you know, the nice thing with writing is you don't have to, you don't have to have a degree to do it. There are MFAs, but if you really are lost and you don't know where to start, um, you don't know how to do it, it's wonderful to seek out writing courses, whether they're the ones the YMCA offers, uh, maybe it's a writing group. There is a Columbia, uh, it's like Columbia Foundry, something like that, um, which helps authors trying to get published in the process. So Columbia itself has these resources too, which you don't have to pay for. Um, I personally definitely be outside of the Columbia courses that help me um, just understand, I, uh, I mean, I'm a writer that just knows how to do it by instinct. I mean, it just comes to me, but it was helpful getting an instructor's kind of breaking down the architecture. It trips me up sometimes. I try not to think about it, but it could just, you know, help. And just for me, I just, the story comes out, you know, I, I, I it's magical. It's a magical process for me, but I totally recommend, um, particularly for writers of color, uh, Qualey. Um, Qualey is run by Laura Pegram. Um, uh, she had been a mentor for me after I took her course and she loved my work and mentored me outside of it. Um, it's a safe place that that course will kick your butt, um, particularly if you want to start with a short story and the art of compression, um, there are resources out there. I don't know if, if that's specific enough, Alyssa. Yes, that's, Paul great. Wants to that's add. a great resource. If you either, either one of you have resources, like please share them for our audience. Uh, and Paul, I do want to highlight, I know that we had a conversation about how you really got into your characters and you got into the details and then you had to work with an editor. Maybe you can share a, lot, a little bit of that perspective as well. Yeah, absolutely. I, I, I love Stephanie's perspective and uh, she's so right. You should probably seek out mentors and take courses. Uh, uh, unfortunately, I didn't do any of the foregoing. And, That's fine. You uh, don't have to, right? That's the great thing. <laughs> no, 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 you should. You should take her advice. My, you know, um, I kind of, you know, did it the wrong way. I, I, I broke all the rules. And um, in, in some in some respects, that's probably why it took me so long to get published. Um, uh, I was told by my editor that you every single scene should 
advance either the character or the story. And there are many times where I would go on for pages and pages and pages about um, completely, you know, uh, ancillary uh, legal concepts that I was told no one would be interested in. But they were interesting to me because I thought, you see all of these, you know, these legal thrillers and they talk about courtroom drama. That's not what my book is about. They talk about, um, and you really don't get a real flavor for what it's like to study for the bar, to prepare, uh, to um, go to law school, what it's like to, to deal with other law school students who are highly competitive. Um, you know, all sorts of things about the legal profession that you don't get from these other kind of movies or stories. I, I wanted to tell that story. And it's tough when you're, you know, you're dealing with an editor. And by the way, my editor was fabulous, but there were whole chunks of, you know, my story that I was told, mm, maybe you want to get rid of that, or maybe you want to add this, or maybe you just want to change the entire sequence of sections of your book. And you have to, you know, you have to kind of be comfortable with that, even if um, you feel as though you can't part with that portion of the book um, in, in order to kind of um, complete the book in a manner that is readable and, and exciting, you certainly have to, uh, I guess, cooperate. And also um, there, there's a give and take throughout the process. So wherever I could, I tried to keep as much of the original novel, but at times um, I, I, did, I did the right thing, I suppose, and um, uh, give in to the better advice of my editor. So uh, there is a give and take in the process. And um, I, I did not have that professional guidance from, uh, from courses prior to writing. I just sat down and wrote and uh, thought about the different experiences that I had. Um, the beginning of you know, my novel was uh, my moot court experience as a first year law student. And um, you know, that just kind of flowed because I lived a lot of it. And a lot of the characters I ran into, obviously there weren't any murders or any you know, scenes with any drug lords, but um, a lot of the characters that I that I've encountered are um, in, in my books, or portions of those characters are in my books, based on folks who I met at some point in my career. Yeah, I I, I think Paul, you, there's two things, great things you brought up. I mean, uh, for the editing process, is a whole other story. That you know, editing is a, can be a very dangerous. Um, <laughs> a dangerous part of your novel if it's done in the wrong hands. Um, and certainly when I was taking um, uh, uh, my courses, my, my, my better work was the, the chapters that weren't workshopped. When there's too many cooks and it's not the right cooks, you might not get you know, a, a great end result. So um, you know, it, it's something that you have to be very careful with. And this especially happens when um, you start querying your, your novels. Um, when I was querying um, uh, uh, both of my novels for an agent, I was trying to get an agent first. I write literary fiction and for literary fiction, you need an agent to get to those publishers. D different genres require different things. You don't need an agent, you do need an agent. Um, but it went through significant edits um, and, um, and it was no guarantee of publication, mind you. And you have to make tough right. decisions. You know, an agent will say, well, why don't you change this? And maybe I'll give it another read. And you have to make these critical decisions um, that, you know, you know I'm, I'm, like, I'm with you, Paul. You know, it took, my first novel was rejected by agents at least 150 times. I queried it. And then I said, let me try my next one. And then for my next one, it took 150 queries to get my to get two offers for an agent. Wow. And then that agent, it didn't work out. So I tried another 100 and now I'm, I'm with my, my current agent. Um, 
but the book went through significant edits and you have to be really careful what you do and make sure, you know, and I, and I left my, my first agent because I did not, it was, my book was being whitewashed and, and to, 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 to make it short, um, you know, I wasn't agreeing with those edits. So, but I also want to say, Paul, to, to compliment you that, um, you know, lawyers are great storytellers. Um, you know, my favorite book is The Mexican Flyboy by um, Alfredo Avea, um, who's a lawyer. And you, you have to be a good storyteller, I think, to be a good lawyer. Um, so you, you had that training. <laughs> you had that, those classes. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. And I, and I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, it's kind of, you have to, you have to fit into a certain formula in order, in order to uh, tell the story properly, but you, you don't kind of want to just kind of, I, I don't write to kind of fit into any particular formula. And I think that that, you know, kind of kills your, your creativity. So it, it, it's, it's a fine line. I, I couldn't agree with you more. So we're gonna we're going to this is very a very rich conversation here and we're going to jump in the Q and A shortly in a few minutes but I would love to just get a little bit more perspective on you know what are the fundamental steps A to you know C what are those steps that you have to kind of go through in order to become published. Wow. from your, your two different perspectives? Because I think people wanna know, like, what do I have to do? I've never written a book. I haven't really thought about writing one, but if I do tomorrow, what are the things that I'm gonna to have to plan for? It's right. not just the creative side, obviously. It's right. the, okay, how do we Got it. bring this to publish? How do we bring this to market? So first it depends on what you're writing. So if you're writing a novel, you have to have a perfect novel. They want a polished, perfect product. If you're doing a nonfiction proposal, you do not have to have a finished product. You need a nice polished proposal and a platform. You do not need a platform to write fiction. They just want a good story. Does it help? Yeah, but they'll figure that out. For nonfiction, you definitely have to have that kind of, uh, it helps to have a platform. So it, the first question is, what are you writing? Because it's totally a different process. Um, you know, from there, you know, you, you, you read a lot, make sure you're reading a lot, you're reading everything. And you know, whatever writing process, whether you do it Paul's way or you do it my way where you take classes, whatever financially works for you, whatever works out for your life, um, just get your story down no matter what, you know, just, just, just get it down. And then, you know, start getting, I mean, if, if you wanna be super specific, some people really outline, and I learned this hard because when I switched to comics, comics, you have to, and I have a graphic novel that's about to go on submission with my agent. You have to outline everything. You have to outline each chapter. What happens here? What happens? I don't do that when I write novels. <laughs> I might say, this happens, this happens, and this is, this is how it ends. Three things I have, but I just let the characters live and dance, and then I figure out the ride, right? Everyone does it differently. Um, but for comics, I have to sit there <laughs> and actually know the entire story each chapter even though i might not know not might not know and then if you're doing graphic novels it's not prose you have to learn how to do a script go to comic cons that's how i learned how to do scripts i didn't go to a class i went to panels so you know the answer right paul i think depends so much on the genre you're writing and what's going on in your life if that makes sense yeah i, I couldn't agree with you more um um, with respect to the genres, yes, you, you were spot on. And with respect to what's going on with your life, absolutely. Um, really, I think I, I take my inspiration from things that happen in my life and kind of interesting things that I, that I encounter. And then um, I'll take notes. And then I'll, um, when I think I have a kind of, uh, a, a body of, of interesting events and, and notes on one particular area, that's when I think I'm ready to start writing. Um, for in, I'll give you, for instance, um, aside from The Golden Prison and the sequel that I'm planning on writing, and I still haven't fleshed out what I'm gonna do for the sequel, 
I recently uh, took a vacation with my family and my in-laws and we all went to, we went to Istanbul. And then from Istanbul, um, we went to the south of Turkey and then uh, got on a boat and went to Greece. And just from that trip and the amazing sights that I saw and the people that I encountered, I took down so many notes, uh, not just about, you know, the food we ate, the places we went and the music that I heard while walking through the streets. Um, that kind of morphed into something else and I'm not gonna talk to you about what it, what it is because I wanna, I wanna get it down and kind of work on it some more, but that's a project that I'm so excited about that I can't wait to start writing about that. And that'll be a completely different book. Um, so what I'm trying to say there is, you know, for me, it's really about, um, um, it, it's really about kind of um, encountering something that moves you and then feeling kind of um, compelled to start putting it down on paper. And that's what happens for me. Um, with respect to the, the the novel that I'm planning for the future, based on my visit to, to Turkey, um, I only have a couple of pages of notes, but my in my mind, I'm constantly thinking about um, different directions that I want to take that story. So uh, I, I hope that's helpful. Uh, I think it's a little, a, a little bit different from what Stephanie mentioned, but um, that that's kind of that's kind of how I get started. Yeah, I mean, on a personal level, I mean, I was being general, you know, but for me, sadly, you know, the my stories, I take a seed of pain from family stories and I wrap a novel around it. My my stories, my novels, my gene. Um, I'll just use Gene as an example. The story I have coming out uh, with speculative fiction for dreamers. Um, really, it, it derives from um, my mom's had a sister who uh, was killed on the Henry Hudson Highway, just walked, jumped out of a moving car, and police um, told my grandmother, no one's going to believe a Puerto Rican, you know, woman, don't bother investigating, we're going to come after the rest of your kids, why was she out that late? And they never found out what happened to Maria, her name was Maria. And, you know, there's a whole story around that, that, that Jean's about, um, you know, and I took that, I took Maria and said, what if she grew up? What if she had a child? And we knew the trajectory that she was on. Um, and I made a story out of that. So on a personal level, I take seeds of my heritage and um, sadly it's filled with uh, sorrow and I weave a fiction story about it. This is a great conversation, but I think we should, we have a lot of great questions in the case yes. that we should move to them, I think. Thank you, Carlos. Yeah, so we want, we, 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 we're seeing a lot of um, specific questions come in and uh, John, if you want to try to uh, consolidate some of them and uh, why don't we, you know, try to be a little bit more efficient, just so we went over time a little bit, but uh, I think it's all good information. Uh, we can then, you know, go into our breakout groups. So let's let's spend another like five minutes because I, I think there everyone has some pressing questions. And it looks like there's a lot of industry questions from what I um, glanced at. Yep. So um, to summarize or to concise a couple of them, uh, if you if you as the authors can talk about, uh, I know you talked about the the pitches and how to launch a book. Um, but you, can you give a little more details on, you know, how to find an agent, um, self-publishing versus going to a publisher, uh, and then going into a publisher, how do you pitch your idea to them? Paul, do you want to go, or do you want me to go first? Well, I'll, I'll just, you know, I'm, I'm actually going to take off on something that you said earlier um, with respect to, to fiction. Um, you, you really do have to have something that is 
more or less complete with respect to a novel uh, and something that is, uh, I'm not gonna say, you know, polished, but is, uh, that's been through a number of different drafts. So, so with, with my novel, it was, you know, I had 300 pages down, I had given it to uh, dozens of different people to comment on, to um, give me their thoughts and perspectives, to try and um, uh, Im improve the work as much as possible and refine it so that when I did send it out that um, it would be well received. So th I think that's the first and foremost. I mean, get, getting the agent and getting the publisher I think should be secondary. I think primary should be producing something that is original, that is well-written, that is uh, uh, a, a little innovative. And if it's, if it's good, you're going to find, you, you'll find a publisher and you'll find an agent. But um, what I have to emphasize is that it may not be, um, it may not be a, a year before you find that publisher. It may not be, I mean, in my case, it was more than a decade. So it takes perseverance. It takes time. It takes effort. But if you stick to it, um, you know, you, you, you will find, you will find the success you're looking for. Yeah, I mean, and, and ha yeah, yeah. I mean, and the point is, is there's so many different paths. But if you're looking for an agent, there's a book they they used to publish that say these are all the literary agents that exist. But there's so there's websites. There's um, uh, absoluteright.com uh, is an online forum um, that shares. Just Google literary agents because they come and go. Um, and all you have to do is learn how to write a query letter, um, a pitch, you know, pitch letter. You have to make sure you have a synopsis, a one page, sometimes have a three page ready. Um, you know, there's there's so many websites and I'm sure we could share this uh, after or in the, in the networking, um, but you're basically gonna do a send a query, you're gonna pitch and you're gonna wait. Um, and you might get a response back in a day. I got an offer two years after the fact of sending my manuscript and, um, you know, that it's, you know, hit or miss. Um, so if for, in this, for some publishers, if you're not, you know, why go for an agent? Agents have access to the bigger publishers, the big four, I think it is now, um, and, you know, potentially more money, but you don't have to get an agent. You can also look which publishers publish, uh, unagented authors. So it really depends on what you're writing. Did that answer it? Uh, if not, just chat and tell us. Great. Thank you. Um, I think we have time for one quick last question. Um, Janet was was talking about she's looking to bring her particular book to a preteen audience, and I think this could be um, appropriate for any sort of genre, um, not just preteen in particular. Um, how do you get into that that audience if you don't know, you know, who else is publishing in there? Um, do you have any recommendations there? I'm sorry, the question was how to get into publishing for so, like, like, middle in, grade in case, and young adult. Yeah, in case somebody was looking at that or maybe something else. Like if how do they find out what publishers are are in that the industry to speak to that particular audience? What research would they need to take? I mean, there's so many different and, and Paul, you could say, hey, I want to go. Um, but there's so many different um, angles. I mean, start going to, to book conferences. And I'm, I'm going, I'm presenting at AWP this year. It's all virtual, it's online, the price is reduced. Um, Association of Writers, I always forget what it stands for. Um, BookCon is canceled right now. So AWP is probably your, your, your first stop. Qualey, actually, um, the Qualey um, course that I mentioned, um, for uh, writers and illustrators of color, they have a child, they have both an adult and kid um, uh, conference every year. Everything's virtual now, take advantage, the price is reduced. I mean, just start going to book events, just start Googling. I honestly just Googled agents that represent Latina <laughs> authors and the agent name came up and I got an offer two years later. I didn't wind up signing with her, but it's sometimes that simple. There's just so many, um, there's just so many things, but definitely just start finding community, whether it's websites or conferences. 
Paul. I don't know. Yeah, the only other thing I would I would add is if you know of any other authors in that area, there are occasions when they do book tours. You'd be surprised. Sometimes they even do. I mean, obviously not now during during COVID, but I remember years ago um, trying to follow certain authors, and um, you, you would be amazed. Some of them some of them do events at local public libraries, and you can get some one in one time with some really good authors, and um, they can give you you know insights with respect to their experiences. So. If that's your area, if it's if preteen is your area, um, you know, I, I would probably look into and see where your favorite author plans on being next. And if there is a, a, a virtual event with one of those authors um, and, and you can find some availability to get in contact with them, that's something that I would do. I just want to uh, highlight that, you know, there are these great questions coming in and we only have a few more minutes before the event ends. So I'm wondering if we should just put, if anyone has any more specific questions, if we should just address those and forego the, um, the networking uh, because we only have a few more minutes um, and then we'll close the event. Uh, this event goes till uh, 845. So I would, I would, um, encourage anyone, if you had any more specific questions, please ask them now so that you can get some insights. Well, at least if I can, I just, first of all, I wanna, I wanna thank you. I wanna thank Stephanie and Carlos and, and John for, uh, and Nick for just a spectacular event. This has been an honor and a pleasure. Please, by all means, share my contact information, share my email address. Everyone is welcome to reach out to me. I'd love to talk to you some more. Um, and, you know, any advice that I can give, um, by all means, do not hesitate to reach out to me. I second the thank you. But yeah, I would love to entertain more questions if people find that more helpful. Whatever works for everyone. As far as networking is concerned, um, I would like to connect with other people writing graphic novels and working on anthologies because I like to, you know, look at, at, at various like anthology opportunities as a great way to just put out short pieces of work. And, um, you know, if there's a community in Columbia that's, that's doing an anthology. I know Barnard has like a zine community. Oh yes, um, I zine as well. I love zines. Yes, me too. <laughs> I, I, there's so there's, um, I would definitely, if you want a paid membership comics experience, um, I've gotten a lot of, um, it, it's an online group um, where comic writers and graphic novel lists, we sh there's, they, they offer classes, you don't have to take the classes, but a lot of my anthologies have come from networking within that group, comics experience. There's also Women in Comics Collective, um, you can check them out too. I don't know about Columbia, but I do know that the, um, I'm forgetting her name. She heads the the whole comic rare book and manuscript library and Karen, oh, Karen Green. Yeah, yeah. Um, you know, oh, I'm sure yes, that's a good, good place to start. Yeah. Um, but they are off the top of my head. Definitely there's some online groups um, for that. And they're important. And anthologies are a wonderful way to start getting your shorts out. People start noticing you. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Okay. Um, were there any other questions? Please feel free to ask them because I'm sure other people are thinking about them as well. Okay. Um, I guess I can ask uh, one more question off of our list. I'm sorry. Um, I'm taking it that Paul and Stephanie are okay with us sharing your email addresses. And if that's the case, then I'm going to drop them in the chat. Is did I hear correctly, I, I Stephanie? I prefer uh, social media would be better. Okay. You could share my social media links and people can DM me there. Uh, I guess we'd love to just know where we can access your published works. Can you maybe just review that so that uh, we can circle back and obtain them to read? Paul, why don't you go first? I've been talking a lot. 
No, 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 absolutely. So, Carlos, by all means, you, you're welcome to share my email. And um, if you're interested in getting a copy of The Golden Prison, please go to Amazon. Just type in my name, Paul Sangillo. The novel will pop up. And um, um, it's, it's getting some nice reviews. Please put a review on there. And uh, by all means, let me know what you think. Yeah, and for me, um, you can definitely go to my website. I'm writing it in the chat now, stephanieninapizzarillos.com. Uh, it has um, all my publications that are um, out, um, whether it be um, comics or short stories. Um, you can get updates if my novel gets picked up. Um, I'm in the house with, uh, with, with Paul and it's a long journey um, <laughs> sometimes. Um, and yeah, I'm very active on social media. My Twitter handle is Zoe Health, Z-O-E Health. And uh, on Instagram, the Nina Galaxy. We had one more question that came in. Uh, how can you self-publish an ebook? Mm. Uh, Paul or me? Um, you know, I, I'm not too knowledgeable on self-publishing, but I know Amazon is a very, I, I, I do have a friend that um, uh, just released a book on Amazon, um, self-published um, first as an ebook. Um, so that's always uh, one option um, is Amazon. But beyond that, I don't know um, if Paul, you know? Yeah, I'll, I'll um, jump in. My my advice on that is it, it is you really have to be careful with uh, some of the self-publishing and you have to, you have to develop a, a, a comfort level with whoever it is that you're dealing with. Some folks recently, you know, reached out to me, they were talking about self-publishing. A lot of these uh, self-publishing outfits will ask for a, uh, a lot of a lot of money up front. They don't really provide anything, any guidance, any editing um, um, uh, throughout the process. And then they're they're basically just you know giving you an opportunity to put your novel online. Um, and there's very little assistance uh, to help you to craft a really good piece of work. So. You have to be very careful about that. Um, uh, as I said to you before, the person who I went with was someone who um, I had known for a number of years and I had developed a, a relationship with this person. So I felt very comfortable giving them my manuscript and um, um, I felt very comfortable with the editor they provided me with. So uh, uh that process appealed to me. Um, what I would say is, if you're going to self-publish, what you really need to do is, um, I would, rather than going with the very first self-publishing company, you probably need to sit down with a number of different companies, um, see what it is that they're offering, see what, um, how much money they're asking for uh, upfront, seeing what kind of package they're offering you, if anything is, is being offered in the way of um, editing, if anything is being offered with, with respect to marketing. Um, some of these outfits um, overpromise and underdeliver, so you have to be very, very careful. Definitely. And if, if you aren't already subscribed to Poets and Writers Magazine, to anyone that's looking to get into writing or being published, it's a wonderful magazine. It's not a lot of money. And they include every single aspect of the publishing process. Like if you're going to be, they had an issue on self-publishing and addressed a lot of the things that Paul just said. Um, and, you know, you, you got to have a lot of hats if you're going to do uh, self-publishing and they do a good job. So, you know, you could definitely go back to their back issues um, and, and pull some really good resources on that. And, and, you know, and keep in mind too, with self-publishing, you know, zines, cool, self-published, they're radical, they're punk, do your thing. I do zines. Um, but if you're hoping for your book to get placed in the library, just as when I wear my volunteer librarian hat and I used to go to a book expo and hang out in the librarian lounge, 
you cannot mention a self-published book to them. They will not acquire it. Um, that's not everyone, but it's just what expectations do you have? Um, or you could be a super bestseller and say, who cares about the library? Um, it could go a lot of ways, but you have to have a lot of hats, like Paul said, if you do self-publishing. Well, thank you so much, Paul and Stephanie. This really opened our eyes to the whole process, to your personal experiences, and we really are so grateful. Uh, I wanna thank both of you for your time and consideration to meet with all of us tonight, and uh, also to the whole LACU and CAA team, uh, teams to put this event together. Thank you everyone for joining thank us so and uh, please be in touch if you have any other questions or wanna know what's coming up with LACU in the future. Thank, thank you. you so much, Alyssa. Everyone, thank you so much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, have a good night, everybody. Thanks for have joining. A great night.